Hey, what up, everybody? This is Stevie Breach coming to you. Watch some more WCW Monday Nitro on the WWE Network. One of the hottest things going out there on there. I know tonight I have to sit down and I'm going to watch the WCW Monday Night Wars with Mick Foley. That's going to be a real good uh, uh, documentary sort of show that was on tonight that uh, I can't wait to watch. Uh, I thought I would knock out letting you know about this third episode of Monday Nitro. This was coming off the heels of uh, War Games, which was Fall Brawl 1995 the night before. I just put a review of that up this morning. Uh, it'll be the, 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 the last video I did before this one, I guess you can say. Man, that was a bad pay-per-view. I was watching through that pay-per-view and I was thinking of maybe giving up on the Nitro Parade and basically just slamming out the Nitros in, in order and watching the pay-per-views as they go along. Um, but basically, I, I pushed my way through it. Uh, there was some stuff on this episode of Nitro that was good. Uh, there was some some uh, of stuff on this that, that was bad. Uh, but but I, you know the, the way that they plugged this show and the way that I don't like the way Eric Bischoff is as a commentator. If Eric Bischoff just was the hype man that talked before and after matches, like send you in the commercials, making sure that you came back. He, he knows that his life is on the line. Basically, he took the job of being in charge of WCW and uh, you know making sure that he was on the right tracks to push into a different direction. Everybody has heard the story about how he got the job. Uh, basically, he was in the wrestling business, but basically Turner wanted to put somebody in charge that you know wasn't really in the wrestling business because he didn't want this run uh, by a wrestler. He wanted it run by somebody that was going to have it on the tracks in order to make money. And uh, that's what they were looking for to do, someone to get them ratings, someone to get them money, and, and get WCW to where WBF was at the time, something that really, you know, would put him on there. So, I mean, he knew that he took a job that was a little bit out of his element. Uh, he ended up being really good at it. He might have stayed in the job a little bit too long. Maybe he had a, a few good uh, decisions, followed by, you know, a few really, really bad decisions and, and staying with one thing. You can say what you want to about Eric Bischoff, but basically... In 1995, uh, Monday Nitro was his baby, and that was the one thing that he was taking care of. So, I mean, as bad as Mongo is, uh, and, I'm, and every week I'm praying for this is the week that he's going to do the run-in, and he's going to start becoming a wrestler just so he's not on commentary anymore. Um, Eric Bischoff is the hype man to make sure that you don't change the channels to WWF. I haven't really heard any of the, uh, the, the slams yet. Um, I, I don't know when those start coming, um, but I'm looking forward to them. But basically, um, this show started off with Kevin Sullivan and the Giant outside of the arena. Uh, they have an ambulance backing down the ramp uh, behind them. The ambulance is so loud that honestly, I wasn't sure that it was the television. I started looking out the window, thinking maybe one of my neighbors had passed out or something like that. It, it scared the shit out of me. Um, but basically, Giant calls himself immortal, saying that he beat up Hulk Hogan at uh, Fall Brawl, and he was never going to return. Uh, basically, that he had snapped his neck, and uh, basically Hulk Hogan wasn't going to be on the show this week. Um, from there, we went to our first match of the night, which was supposed to be the American Males uh, going up against the Blue Bloods. Uh, the American Males uh, came out and made their way to the ring, and as the Blue Bloods were being announced, they were jumped from behind uh, by Harlem Heat. Nobody knew really what was going down. The American Males were concerned in the ring what was going down. Were they going to get beat up next? Harlem Heat makes their way down to the rings. They grab the microphone, and they brag that they became the WCW Tag Team Champions uh, last night at the show, and they were going to be fighting champions, and they were going to make sure that they were featured on Monday Nitro because they were the new WCW Tag Team Champions, and they need everyone to know this so basically they challenged the american males to a match the american males say well we weren't getting a tag title match a minute ago but what's the worst that's gonna happen we'll lose the match i mean you're not really making us put anything on the line uh they have a pretty good match the american males uh, also known as uh, who would become Buff Bagwell at the time he was Marcus Bagwell and scotty riggs uh riggs is the guy that most people would know as a guy that you know sort of after the the American Males broke up and Buff joined, uh, you know the NWO. Uh, Riggs was the babyface that never really got over. After the fact, he ended up joining the uh, Ravens Flock, and it was a name in there. People remembered him as being a former tag team champion, but he was just some dude. As this match is going on, uh, basically Colonel Robert Parker comes running down to ringside. He's not involved in this, and you can remember back to Fall Brawl. Uh, basically, what led to you know, uh, Harlem Heat winning the tag team championships um, from uh, what was it 
Slater and Murdoch, or I can't remember who they fought at Fall Brawl, but um, basically it was because Robert Parker and Sherry started making out in the ring and it caused distraction. Harlem Heat took advantage of it. They got the one, two, three. They started making out again, and basically uh, um, Bagwell was able to hit a scoop slam on Stevie Ray because he, he can't believe what he's seeing out there. These people hated each other so much just two weeks ago. Now that they're, they hate each other so bad, it built up this attraction where basically they can't keep their hands off each other. And American Males, via pinfall, they become the new WCW World Heavyweight Tag Team Champions. And everyone in the world is shocked. I mean, this was a match that wasn't even supposed to happen. Scotty Riggs and... And uh, Marcus Bagwell go on to become uh, tag team champions. This is probably like the third time Buff had been champion uh, in WCW. He just was the guy that sort of got new partners all the time. He was stuck in tag teams, and they just kept on becoming tag team champions, things like that. From there, we go to an, uh, an interview uh, with Mean Gene and Ric Flair, where basically uh, Ric Flair's calling out Art Anderson, saying that basically because Pillman ran in during the match, uh, that you know it sort of broke the code of the horseman. Uh, and that he wants a rematch. He, he wants the match to happen tonight. Um, that match isn't going to happen. So he, he says he's going to fight Pillman uh, instead. So the, the main event is set one-on-one -on -one Ric Flair against Brian Pillman in what should be a really good match from there. Uh, from there we go to a horrible segment that shows Paul Orndorff. Uh, basically he had lost his swagger in WCW and basically he refound himself through his, like some acid trip in the back and he started coming out all just totally hokey. I don't know really what they were doing, but the repackaging of Paul Orndorff didn't work for anybody. Uh, he fights Johnny B. Bad, uh, the new number one contender for the United States Championship uh, with Sting. Uh, they hype up this match uh, throughout the whole match, and Paul Orndorff beats him. <laughs> and it doesn't make any sense at all why you would beat a guy that you've been hyping up for the last you know, 10 minutes uh, as being you know, the number one contender to the United States Championship, and he just lost to Paul Orndorff, the guy that hasn't been a name in the wrestling business since WrestleMania 1. Um, I guess he was sort of a name around WrestleMania 3, even though he wasn't featured on the card. A lot of people say that he was supposed to be the backup for uh, Andre the Giant in case he either backed out of the match or Andre got hurt and wasn't able to do it, and that was the reason why they didn't book him on the show. But, um, you know, from there we go to... Uh, uh, looks like a hype video for uh, Randy Savage hanging out on the set of Baywatch with uh, none of the actors of Baywatch, but a whole lot of people dressed up like they are on Baywatch, uh, from the guy in the orange jacket and the girls in the uh, custom Baywatch bathing suits. And he's lifting weights, and it looks like he's a badass. And then all of a sudden, some guy comes running up out of nowhere, and it ends up being Kevin Sullivan dressed up like he's a Baywatch lifeguard. And uh, he throws sand in Randy Savage's eyes. And this starts a fight on the beach where basically Kevin Sullivan puts the, the bench press down and he's trying to choke out Randy Savage. And uh, uh, basically, uh, um, that's supposed to hype up a match, I would guess. Uh, from there we go to Mean Gene, who calls out Randy Savage for an interview, uh, who barely even talks about the attack that we just saw from Kel Ke Kevin Sullivan on the beach. Um, Savage is saying that, that Hogan made a horrible decision by putting Luger on the team at War Games. They won the match. Savage. They won. <laughs> and you're saying it was a bad decision. Um, Savage is all pissed off because there's just one point in the match where Luger accidentally hits Savage. It's very blatant uh, that Luger did it accidentally. And uh, Savage is, was just in the wrong place at the wrong time. But Savage is calling out Luger, uh, saying that basically you're either with me or against me, and I don't think you're together. Luger makes his way down to the ring. Luger says that basically Savage has his own agenda to become world champion, just like Luger does. Luger says he came to WCW because he wanted to be where the big boys were. And uh, this was you know WCW's slogan at the time, that they're really trying to get over where the big boys play. And uh, that, that's mostly just because they had you know, sucked up all the main event talent at a WWF and left them with Bret Hart and, and uh, Shawn Michaels. Uh, Diesel was there, Psycho Sid was there, but uh, you know, the, all of the big names you know from the 80s that you know brought WWF glory at the time were now in WCW, and that was the, what they were really trying to get over. Um, basically, Savage and Luger are insulting each other. Savage is asking for a match. Uh, Luger grants in the match. No word on when this match is going to happen. Uh, but we come back and they show clips of at Fall Brawl. 
uh, the giant running over Hulk Hogan's motorcycle outside, um, you know, before the events happened, which would lead to the machine versus machine match at Halloween Havoc, which everybody should be dreadfully fearing watching. Uh, but if you do want to check it out, it is the very first thing on the Halloween Havoc 1995 pay-per-view. Uh, you get to see basically, um, you know, two monster trucks, Hulk Hogan versus the giant driven by the wrestlers push each other around and they didn't have anywhere else better to fight than on top of the arena that the pay-per-view was going to be housed in. I had so many questions about this. This is, I don't know to waste them on this Nitro review or wait till that thing, but just my first question is how much money did it cost WCW to get the monster trucks on top of the arena? Uh, you know, but you know, where the story goes from there, you'll have to check out the Halloween Havoc review. It's going to come sooner than later because I'm burning through these nitros. 45 minutes a piece. They're awesome. You can't go wrong. Uh, Pillman versus Flair ends up being probably one of the best matches that I've seen from the three episodes of Nitro so far. Um, Pillman was a great wrestler. I know that I sort of said that the match with him and uh, Jushin Liger was a little bit overrated because a lot of people always sort of put it over as one of the best uh, matches that Nitro ever had. But I think Pillman and Flair, I don't know if it's on the the, uh, the Nitro set, Volume 1 or Volume 2, but to me, this is one of the best matches that I've seen. Uh, Pillman... Uh, you know, who, who is paired up with Arn Anderson, trying to prove himself to Ric Flair, maybe even trying to become the new Ric Flair of the Four Horsemen. Um, you know, basically, Flair makes uh, Pillman tap out with the figure four, but this was a great match. After this, Flair taunts uh, Pillman, and he calls out Arn Anderson. He says he wants his rematch, and he wants it sooner than later. Uh, at the end of Nitro, they plug up next week's show, trying to bring you to come back. Uh, basically saying that next week we're going to get Kevin Sullivan versus Randy Savage. Uh, Disco Ferno is going to make his Monday Nitro debut, and he's going to have a match against Alex Wright. And then Lex Luger is going to face uh, a member of the uh, uh, Dungeon of Doom in Meng. Uh, so three big matches to bring you back for next week. But uh, very fun, only an hour. You know, basically head over to WWE Network, nine ninety nine a month, WCW Nitro. Real fun. Peace out.